in an era when you know people like my students, the younger generation, this is their language, the, the, the visual storytelling language. I mean, they read things largely because people like me force them to read, uh, assign them to read. But you know, their their primary skills increasingly are visual skills. They want to learn how to make documentaries. They want to learn how to do uh, uh, fictional films. They want they, they want to learn the visual storytelling language. And that's what I've been doing since 1977. You know, I started out as a reporter who made pictures. Then I, I, I was a, 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 an editor for, for United Press International, a foreign correspondent for United Press International. I worked for Newsweek magazine for 10 years, most of it based in, in uh, Managua, Nicaragua, covering the Contra War during the 80s, the, the, the Civil War in El Salvador. Um, um, toward the end of the 80s and in, in, in the beginning of the 90s, I saw the writing on the wall. And the writing on the wall about photojournalism was not that good because you know more and more people had these. They were equipped with these things, and and you know everybody all of a sudden who had one of these is a, is a contributing photographer on on uh, places like Facebook and Instagram and whatever, which didn't exist you know uh, when I first started uh, uh, th this craft. So I've got a three minute piece. I'll share that with you, and you can see how this what I call this 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 revolution, this technological revolution. Has has brought us to where we are today. It's a little. It's it's not completely up to date, um, which is my fault. But um, it it'll you'll, you'll have a sense here of, of what we're doing. This is my web. School. I have. To, I guess I have to share the screen. Sorry. I'm going to go to. Okay, can you see this now? There's a soldier here. I have a, there's a, a, a color picture here. Can you all see that? No, all right, I'm getting signs of no there. Um, I'm gonna go back. Before we were able to see your screen, what you shared it. There you go, I got it. Okay, Great. you can see that now, yeah? Yeah, this is my this is my website. It's really easy. It's BillGentile.com. Um, uh, this is this is the piece that I want to show you this morning. Down here are some pictures that I, that I, that uh, are, are from my my uh, book of photographs on Nicaragua. Again, I lived in Nicaragua for for uh, a number of years and and um, you know made made a, a book of photos about the place. Uh, this is when I was working for Newsweek magazine. Um, but what I'm going to show you here, I'm going to go back up to. This space here, and you'll see the beginning and the middle of the end of, of, of kind of my story. Speak 
the visual storytelling language. How are That's what I practice, and that's what I teach. Can you all see me? I should be back. We see you, yeah. Okay, great. Um, you know, as, as I say, toward the end of the 80s, the beginning of the 90s, I saw the writing on the wall, and the writing said that, you know, still photography, although it's fantastic, is, 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 is it's coming to an end, um, at least as we know it. You know, this, this is one of the tools that I used to use to make the pictures for Newsweek Magazine, United Press International. I love these tools. They're fantastic. They're, they're, they're ergonomic. They're, they're, you know, they're, 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 uh, accurate, they're precise machinery, um, but you know, these are this. This is a film camera, and very, very few people are using film anymore because you know digital has taken its place. That's part of the, the technology revolution. Um, I went to it, when I left mag Newsweek magazine. I guess it was around 1995, and I went to work for a company called Video News International. It was the first company in the United States of America to understand that these new digital cameras that were emerging, that were coming onto the market, they weren't professional cameras, they were consumer cameras. But the people who started this company, VNI, which is based in Philadelphia, um, they understood that, that, that these, these little machines could begin to take the place of these monster beta cams, which were really, really, really expensive. And you had to have you know $50,000 to buy one and you had to have a, an editing suite that was worth a million dollars. Um, uh, you know, these people at VNI, you know, they were ahead of their time and, and they understood that these little cameras that cost a couple hundred bucks could actually be used for television production. So they started the company on that basis. Um, I started to work with them around 1995 and I've got here a piece that, that really, it was the first piece that I did for them. Um, it, it was a, a, about a chain gang in, in Alabama. It's about 14 minutes long. And, and, and because we have some time this morning, I wanna share this with you because there are so many teaching points here. Teaching points about access, teaching points about how to shoot, teaching points about interviews, teaching points about you know, characters, all of the dramatic arcs, it's all here in this one package. And the people at VNI, you know, not because I was fantastic or anything like that, but, but you know, I did have the advantage of, of acquiring so many skills, all the skills that were necessary to do documentaries that were that you needed to do television work that you needed to put coherent pieces together. And those are, you know, because I was a print correspondent, I knew how to write. Because I was a radio a stringer for ABC and NBC radio, I knew how to write a script and I knew how to narrate. Because I was a photographer for United Press International and Newsweek Magazine, I knew how to make powerful pictures. And powerful pictures, of course, they're the engine inside this thing we call video journalism. This really is an extraordinary juncture in the history of mankind and technology. Like I say in, in, in my reel, it's the first time in the history of the world that we can communicate instantly, globally, and in a language that everybody can understand. That's the visual storytelling language. That's what we're gonna talk about today. I'm gonna to show you this piece and, and please, you know, uh, uh, while we're seeing it, you know, think about what makes this thing good. If you think it's good uh, or think about what makes it not so good if you think it's not so good. Let me go to another, okay. And I'm gonna share a screen again and I'm gonna go to here. And again, this is 14 minutes. Um, it, thankfully it's not as graphic as the previous piece but the lessons learned here are I think really, really important. And, and again, as we, as we watch this thing, you know, think about what makes this compelling or not. Think about the structure that somebody has built behind the screen that you're watching. Somebody had to build that, build that structure. In this case, it was me. Ah. 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 
Tighten it up. Come on, gentlemen. Covid. Ben Crenshaw. Take your shirt, Carol Crenshaw. Hal Lobby. I'm up first. I got you. I got you. <laughs> My name is Michael Martin here. I'm 42 years old. I'm in here for fraud, embezzlement. Richard Hayes. This is one of the most degrading things in the world to me. A man don't supposed to be down like this. And then I don't like being out here around these cotton fields with these chains on me. The only people that ever been in chains and slavery in this country been black folks. And then they have me out here in chains under these same conditions and tell me to work around some cotton fields I was supposed to feel. Michael Martineer and 400 other inmates at the Limestone Correctional Facility in Alabama are the first in the nation to be put back on the chain gang. Pick up the chain! Let's ride! When I lay down at night, or when they put those chains on me and I have to get on the, on the ground, on my hands and knees like a dog, you know, I think about slavery. Because all the time that I was young, when I ever seen chains, it was on black people. It's a sight most Americans haven't seen in decades. Prisoners working by the roadsides and in fields, shackled at the ankles in groups of five. The hours are long. The sun is hot. The complaints are frequent. That don't make no sense, man. We got a cooler full of hot water. You go hot water, man. Drive 30 miles before you tell you that one. Every once in a while, they'll air some complaints about having to wear the chains and the leg irons. They're pretty well stuck on the idea they're going to have to do that, but all the complaining in the world is not going to do any good. They'll get your shoe strings off them chains. Let's go. Some inmates, like Mark Neer, find their own ways of getting around the system. You got to work. They can't tell you how hard to work. The chain gang program was introduced in May as a way of discouraging parole violators repeat and first-time offenders. I'm good. I'll be here one afternoon this week. I mean, personally, when I first heard about this, I said, this is crazy. We're going to chain people going back to the 20s. You know, that's what I, that was my first impression. And now that we're doing it, I think it's great. I think it's a good program. I really do. I've been on the chain uh, two weeks. What's it like? No, it's, it's hell. Billy Mitchell is serving a life sentence for robbery. As you can see, we drag each other all day long, like animals. One man gets out of step, another man gets hurt. We go in, our ankles, our ankles are, are messed up, our legs are raw. The thing couldn't on my ankles. Bruised all the way around them. Chain pulling going up and down, scraping on your leg. I say this is not going to help. Degrade and de demoralize a man to this extent. This is not going to help society with their problems. Well, to me, it's not degrading or inhumane. Uh, the problem that they have expressed to me is they, they feel, again, it's throwback to slavery. And, of course, it's not that. Uh, it's not in huge main because it, it doesn't harm them in any way. We've had zero reports from our medical unit. How long you had those? Uh, about two weeks. I've seen a doctor, a nurse today. I got to put me up for a doctor next Thursday. So, medical injury ain't no shit. Let's go! First line, right there. First line, y'all step on up right here. The public has gotten tired of crime. Uh, individual cannot go to a mall and, and uh, without fear of being attacked in the parking lot. And uh, it's it's basically, uh, hey, we're tired of this. We want something done. We want to get tough approach to crime, and, and this is what we're doing. Chains ain't gonna stop no crime. So what make them think that a piece of metal on somebody's ankles is going to deter crime? Well, they got a death penalty that ain't stopping crime one bit. It's 18 to 32. Right up at the door. But for some inmates, like Robbie Satterfield, the chain gang seems to be a powerful incentive to stay out of trouble. I've been here for uh, over 30 days now, and this right here has had an effect on me. I don't want to come back to the penitentiary. I don't want to come back. Satterfield served 10 years for car theft before violating his parole 
and ending up on the chain gang. They're very abusive here, as you can see. This country club's not cut out to what I thought it was going to be. <laughs> we want to revoke our uh, membership. Yeah, we want to revoke our membership and get out, but they won't let us now. They said we signed up for 15 years. We have to do it. <laughs> for Satterfield, the chains are another rough step in a life full of hardship. I think the uh, main reason that I'm in the penitentiary right now is because of the uh, the atmosphere that I was raised in. My father was alcoholic. Uh, he beat my mother. Uh, this was a regular routine, and I watched this all the way until he got killed. He got murdered at a bar when I was seven years old for beating my mother. A uh, man shot him in the back with a pump shotgun. All the people that I, I had in my life that I was socialized with was uh, drunks, drug addicts, and thieves. You know, so that's what I grew up to be. You know, that's why I'm in here now. There are more than just chains to the chain gang. All 400 prisoners live in a converted warehouse. There's no privacy, no TV, no store, no exercise equipment, no family visits. Not seeing my family is the worst thing for me. I've got a wife and I've got two kids. Uh, a little boy that's two, that's gonna be two years old to 15th of this month, and I'm gonna miss his birthday. Inmates on the chain gang also get less food than inmates in the main prison. I believe ever since I've been here, since 39 days, I believe I've went out of that uh, dining hall three times full. Uh, the other times I was still hungry when I walked out. With little to do, time can seem as though it's standing still. I don't like weekends. You know, weekends just, they kind of like just rock my world. And then you have more time to sit around on the weekend and you get to thinking more about home and a lot of stupid things you done done. Martin Ear grew up in a middle-class neighborhood in Hartford, Connecticut. Privilege, I can say, I can, I can say by the grace of God, yeah, um, I, had a, I, had a, I had a damn good childhood, you know? I had a good one. And it's funny because I've had people ask me over the years, when I was getting in trouble, you know, one of the biggest questions would be, why do you do this, why do you do that and stuff? And even to this day, you know, it's hard to explain. On the weekends, the prison yard becomes a mosque to some. Jesus making his way to this place, a church to others, <laughs> and a gym for many. There are no weights, but the prisoners make do with what they find. Get them off the cans and get them stretched. Instead of doing regular push-ups, because you can't go down as far, when you go off the cans, you go past your shoulders, you go on down. And get more stretch out of it, get more work out. That's the only thing we got to work with since they don't let us have any weights over here. And it's the only way that we can stay in shape. But too many men with too much time and too little space can be explosive. <laughs> This inmate got into a fight with a guard over an extra serving of food. Another was beaten by inmates for informing on the first. What happened out there, brother? Officer jumped on me in the kitchen. Man, he was swinging death licks at me with his stick. And just so happened, he just, he, he just, I just retaliated and caught his stick and held on to his stick with a death hope. Captain, you're getting out of this dorm. Oh, 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 oh. I've been in this dorm too long. A lot of the public has a conception that an inmate comes to prison, he lays up on his butt all day and watches color TV in an air-conditioned room and doesn't have to do nothing but sit back and get three meals fed to him a day and all that. But now you've been through that environment down there. Would you want to be there? <laughs> I don't think I would. It's a tough situation that's about to get tougher. The state plans to add 200 more inmates to the gangs and to triple up the bunks. If they make it really hard, the way they're talking about doing, taking everything out and making people stay in here six months and stuff, I think there's going to be a lot of fights in here. I think there's going to be a lot of hostility. When they take it all away and they start this all throughout the country, they're going to have problems. It's going to be Attica spread. It's going to be Attica all around the country. Inmates' tolerance for the chains and the tough conditions is wearing thin. 
you take a man out there and you tie him on a chain and you work him all day and you come back and feed him a, a few peas and a piece of cornbread and you think, well, he, he ought to be able to live off that. It's the shackles and, and the way they treat you, cuss you out, uh, that really the reason why everybody don't like is being treated like an animal, still like a human being. People here, if, you, if they were off the chain and they talked to us the way they did, these inmates, and I mean 80% of them would be jumping on that guard because nobody gets talked to like that. Now, your name is? David Payne. David, how old are you? 26. And you're in here for? Aggravated assault. Yes, sir. Or parole violation. My aggravated. My first felony. And how, uh, how much time did they give you? Four years. Four years. Okay. And I'm Joe Hartwell, 50, or, yeah, 15, yeah, 52, and I'm in here for parole violation for being outside the county. I got 15 years. Pete Sims, 42, in here for theft. How long? Three years. How old are you, Pete? 42. Is your first time in here? First round. Do you think this chain gang experience is going to keep you out of here on the second time? Chain gang experience ain't gonna keep me out of nothing. It's just like being an alcoholic, going to a treatment center ain't gonna keep you out of nothing. Out of, ain't gonna keep you from drinking. You have to do that yourself. Daryl Smith, assault, two year split on 15. Inmates are not the only ones worried about pushing the tough conditions and tight quarters too far. We don't wanna push it too tight. If we screw it too tight, this place could blow or any other prison could blow. Not just limestone correctional stuff, but any prison in this nation. You put the screws on these guys too tight, they will blow. The prisoners who make trouble or refuse to go quietly to the chains are kept in an isolation ward. Are you going to report the story the way you see it or the way they want it told? That's the way it happens. Again, I must say the degradation of this black man is complete. What little amount of dignity I have is gone with this program, this chain. It's not really cruel. It may be considered punishment, but they were sentenced to do time. And last I heard, the judge said it, do that time and hard labor. Hard labor don't mean laying up in bed watching TV. The chain gangs were brought in, at least in part, to help the prison system save money. Fewer guards are needed to watch inmates in chains. Not all officers feel safe on the highways, guarding men who are getting angrier every day. It can be very dangerous. Uh, they can find anything laying out there on that road. And it wouldn't be a real pretty picture if they're walking down that highway picking up uh, trash and one of them finds a loaded gun that possibly one of their buddies threw out the day before. So, you know, that, that's kind of frightening to think that one day you may be walking squad and all of a sudden the guy turns around and say, all right, give me your gun, officer. The big question for prison authorities may be how far they can push the threshold of punishment before crossing the line. I see this chain gang ended in Alabama tragically. Not because they passed something or legislative to outdo it, not because of the public outcry, but I actually see either some inmates getting killed or some officers getting killed out there. Something tragic is going to happen. For Satterfield, the chain gang represents more than just a personal threat. I realize I've done wrong out there, and that's why I'm in here. But uh, uh, you just can't keep pushing a man and pushing a man to the limit. Eventually, the man's going to fight back. If you came back here 10 years from now, all you would have is a bigger chain game. And the next thing they will be saying, well, we're going to put the cuff on their neck and chain them together and see how that works. Chain game. Nowhere but in America, baby. This is Bill Gentile reporting. You should be seeing me now. And before I ask you what you thought of this piece, um, let me give you some background. Uh, um, this, the story about the chain gang, when, when Alabama first re, re, reinitiated them, uh, was on the front page of the New York Times in, in 19, 1995, I guess it was. And um, you know, once this thing got out, once it was published in the paper, uh, the, the prison was, was swamped with journalists from everywhere. They had 
wire services, local and regional newspapers. They had a, a, a crew from the BBC come in. I think there was a, a crew from German television. They flew in from somewhere, probably New York or Washington. I mean, everybody invaded the place. And, and, and the, the, the prison authorities cooperated with them only to the degree that, the, the, I think they gave them a press conference outside of the, of the, the confines of the prison. Um, and of course, when they were out, you know, making pictures of people on the highways, that's public property and, and you know, no one can stop anybody from making pictures of prisoners there. But nobody got into the, uh, to, the, in, uh, to the prison. No one had that kind of access. So I called the, the prison about a month after the story um, appeared and a month after, you know, the invasion of, of, of media people uh, was over. And the guy who you saw in the film, the guy who was kind of like chewing on this crooked cigar said, yeah, you can come down, you know, I'll give you access. So I show up and go into his office one morning and he says, well, where's the crew? And I said, well, I'm the crew. He says, well, where's, where's the cameraman and the producer and, and the sound person? I said, no, no, I'm it. I'm, 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 I'm the whole thing. And he said, well, okay, well, you know, you can come in and, and, and when you want to go, when you want to just make sure the guys with the guns at the front entrance know that you're either coming and going so you don't get lost in the shuffle. Uh, Cause things can turn kind of, kind of, you know, uh, uh, dangerous there. And I said, fine. So I had four days to do this piece. My people in Philadelphia said, okay, we'll, we'll pay the expenses. We'll fly you down there. We'll put you up in a hotel. We'll pay you while you're there. Um, but you have four days to make this piece and you get back to the Philadelphia. I said, fine. So I go there and I'm faced with the task of finding a way to tell this story. So let me ask you now that you know the background, is the piece compelling or not? And, 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 and if so, why? If, if not so, why not? Any ideas? Can I, can I say something? Hi, Dina. Hi. Hi, Bill. Uh, I think the piece is very, very compelling. I really like that you let the visuals and the sound bites tell most of the stories. And you use the last narration there. But when the words come out, when the narration came out, it's almost it sounds like a poetry to me. So because sometimes <clears throat> I feel like these days, uh, to me personally, I feel like I want to put so many information, as many information possible. So the, nar the narration is coming uh, as long as the visual itself. So, but then when I look at your, your, your piece, I think it is, like you said, visual tell, uh, the, I think is the most compelling way to tell a story. So yeah. I think we, yeah, we should let the, the visual tell the story itself. So I think it's very, very compelling to me. Thank you. You know, this is, I'm glad you raised this issue because you know, uh, narration, I try to use as little narration as possible because in theory, what I tell my students at the university is you should be able to turn the sound completely off on this thing. I would never do that because, you know, I want the, the, the additional information besides the pictures. But if, if you know how to work the camera, if you know how to speak the visual uh, 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 storytelling language, and this is critical because this language, just like any other language, like Spanish or German or French or whatever, you know, it has rules, it has an, an alphabet, it has a, a, a grammar to it. If you know how to speak this, this language, then people should be able to understand what the film is about with no narration at all, with no sound at all. You could, you know, you, you should be able to tell what's happening there. And, 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 if, and if you, you know, run this thing by in your head, You'll see that I think that, that, that I've got a point here. Who else uh, want to say anything about the film? Does it work or not? Yeah, what make... Go ahead. Okay, no, I was going to say it, for me, it was indeed compelling, especially what for me, one thing that made it even more compelling is the fact that you had access to the inmates themselves for them to tell their own story. Because oftentimes when we see pieces about the prison facilities, just you know, the prison guards, the wardens, the officials there who tell their story. Right. And maybe sometimes for the inmates, it, it may be their lawyers speaking for them and they get just like a few sound bites in there. But in this case, you had a lot of them telling their own story, even telling you how they feel about being in chains, Yeah. comparing it to slavery, and then having the officials <laughs> Um, seeming a little more blasé about it like yeah you know well they're in chains but it's not the same yeah. as being slaves it's not the same as the slavery era you know that contradiction yeah, for me it worked yeah great great anybody else someone hand someone's hand is raised here i'm not sure who this is no no other hands okay so 
tell me about tell me about the technique that I use to tell this story. Does anybody give, give give me a sense of you know what makes this piece run? I mean, aside from the visuals, I get it. You're right, Vina, and 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 sir, you're right. And, and I don't see your your knee. Yes. Yeah, knee. Um, I let the prisoners talk. How do I figure out? And in, you're actually addressing one of the keys to this whole language. You're addressing the issue of characters. Okay. I mean, you, you, I can stand here and throw tons of information and statistics about the prison system in the United States, about chain gangs, about when they started, about slavery, about everything. But if I don't, if I don't make that information accessible to you, and 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 if some way you can recognize this, and, and if I don't tell that through characters, what I'm going, what is what I'm going after right now, then they're just numbers, and you forget about the numbers. But you're not going to forget about that white guy. You're not going to forget about the, the black guy in the film. You're not going to forget about the, the, the white guy who says, "I'm in here because everybody who I knew when I was a kid was a, a, a thief, a drug addict, or, or, or a thief, drunk, a, a drunkard, or a drunk drug addict, something like that." Uh, you're not going to forget that, and you're not going to forget Michael who was raised in a middle-class family in Connecticut, but he kept messing up all his life. So you got to have these characters. How do you find these characters? How do you, again, I had four days to do this piece. How do I find these characters? Would I send out a mailing list before that, and, you know, say, who wants to be a character in my film? How do you do that? And this I is a challenge that all of you will face every time you go out and make one of these pieces, because the pieces have to be built around, you use you use the characters as vehicles that take you from one end of the dramatic arc, we'll discuss this later, from one end of it all the way up here until the climax of the dramatic arc, the, 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 the characters that you choose are, are vehicles who move that information and move the audience from the beginning to the end. How do I, how do I, how do I go into this prison? There were 400 guys there. How do I select those two? Anybody? I guess you probably way... ask. Yeah, oh, Navina, go ahead. Oh, okay. I don't know, maybe you ask the, the prison guard, one of the prison guards and ask you, uh, and you ask them about who is here with the most, who, who is uh, talkative. <laughs> okay, yeah. all right, I could do that. I could start there, anybody else? Nick? Yeah, I was, I was thinking maybe you, one way I would probably have done that, apart from speaking to the prison authorities about, you know, just getting maybe files on the, inmates to see a bit of their record also will be to speak with the inmates themselves maybe on my first day before I start shooting speak with as many of them as I can get their stories and then from there I can decide whose story I feel is a bit more compelling and who is more willing to share their story and then I could go with such okay. people actually I have I have a three-point test for for choosing characters and I'll show you what I did the first the first 45 minutes when I went into the prison, I'm going to pretend this is a video camera. It's not a video camera. It's a seal camera, but we'll pretend it's a video camera. We'll pretend it's the camera that I was using that day. Okay. And I'll show you what I did for about the first hour or so um, when I went to the prison. It was this. This is what I did. You know, walked around in the yard, went outside where the guys were exercising, you know, walked into the cafeteria. I got into the bathrooms. Imagine this access. I mean, be, I, I'm only one person, and and people don't have to. The, the, the authorities there didn't have to worry about four people, four or five people running around the prison. They just had one guy they had to be concerned about, and that's one of the advantages of, of this whole backpack journalism. When I can fit everything into this, okay, my backpack, I can make I can make hours long documentaries with with the, the stuff in that. So this is what I did, and some of the guys walked up to me and said, if you point that camera to, toward me, I'm going to break it over your head. And I, I got it, man. I'm cool. You're not going to be in the film. I got it. Okay. Uh, and the other ones, like, like Michael and Robbie, came up to me and said, well, you know, who are you working for? Or what, what kind of a story are you doing? Or what's your outlet? Or, you know, they started to talk to me. So, so I know that these people passed the first, the first of the three points that I need to choose characters. Number one, you know, they want to be in the film. They're curious. They want to be, they want, they want people to, to listen to them. They want to say something that's, that's going to go beyond the fence that keeps them in the prison. I got that. That's number one. Number two is any volunteers? The second point is, I think Vina, you kind of touched it. It's, it's do these people, does, does the character, the possible character have a story to tell? 
right? A compelling story. And I'll tell you, you know, I could have gone to, to uh, you know, Los Angeles, Hollywood and, and, and you know, at, at central casting and look for a couple of characters like, like the people that I selected and, and they weren't going to be better than, than, than Michael and, and, and Robbie because these guys were authentic. They had extraordinary, you know, Robbie's father was killed by a guy with a, with a pump shotgun who shot him in a bar for having beaten his mother. You don't get better stories than that. So both of these guys had compelling stories. And the last rule that I use is if they're articulate enough to tell them, because I ran into some other people in the prison who had just incredible stories about abuse, about drugs, about, you know, alcoholism, about whatever, you know, uh, which is why they're there. But they had, they had trouble explaining this stuff in a coherent, in a, in, in a compelling way. So those are the three tests. You want to be in the film, you have a good story to tell, and can you, can you, are, you, are you capable of, of telling the story in a, in a, in a, in a, in a compelling way? Um, so once you, once you get, so I selected these guys and they turn out to be, they turn out to be terrific. Anybody else want to comment on the film? Anything stand out to you? Any strengths or weaknesses? No? All right. Um, so, Hi, Bills. Yes. Hi, I'm Elena. Yeah, I can, I can say that um, it's one thing that I think I learned in journalism classes for television uh -huh. by telling the story with an inmate, with someone, with a character, and then you go telling on what they're doing, like you show our, as the chains, then you go on why are they there, and then you go on the authorities, and then you go on something else, so it's like you chose the good a good point, like a maybe a small character, a person, you see a person, and you start telling, you know, like seeing the story, and then you start understanding all the environment. I think that's... Yeah. One that's of the things you have to keep in mind, uh, uh, Elena, is, you know, you have to, when you do the research, when, when, before I go anywhere, whether it's, you know, in Alabama to do a piece on, on, on uh, you know, uh, the chain gang, if it's in Afghanistan, you saw pictures in my reel, that I was hanging out with U.S. Uh, US Marine, uh, uh, Marines in, in, in um, where was it? Um, I for, forget the province, in Southern Afghanistan with, with the Marines, with the 24th Marine Expeditionary Unit. You have to have some idea of what the story is gonna be like. You know, a lot of times you get there and it's like totally different, but and then you, you change what I call the controlling idea. The controlling idea is the central theme of this piece. It's the meaning of the piece. It's the core of the piece. It's the, it's the, the line of logic that runs through the beginning and the middle of an end. If you don't have a controlling idea, you will find yourself, you know, what I call spray and pray, which is exactly the thing that you don't want to be doing, you know, especially with beginners and, and film cameras, they'll go out and just blast everything in sight, you know, without, without you know, figuring out why or, or where, or, 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 but, you know, any controlling idea they have. And then when they get back into the editing suite, it'll be like, they'll pray that some of the stuff makes sense. You know, this, this craft is really about staying really vigilant and asking yourself all the time, what's the story now? What's the story now? Because it changes and your controlling idea can change as you gather more information. So you have to, you, you have to be vigilant about and, and, and anticipating what's going to happen and defining what happens. When I found these two guys, I made sure that I stuck with them the, the whole four days that I were there. I, I asked them repeated questions. I did formal and informal interviews. The formal interviews where you saw Michael, he's sitting down and he's, you know, a couple of guys were behind him and he's talking to camera and I'm up on a little tripod and, and he's talking to me. The informal ones were the ones that I did in, in, in the prison yard saying, why are you in here? How about you? What did you do? Why are you in here? How do you feel about the chain gang? It's this spontaneous interviews these, these, these back and forth with, with your subjects that really give your piece a sense of immediacy and draws the audience in. It makes the audience feel like, you know, they're talking to them. That, that's really important. So I did, you know, formal and formal interviews, but I, I understood what my controlling idea is. And that was to give these people voice about the conditions in the chain gang. You know, they're doing something that was done in this country in the 1920s and 30s. And all of a sudden the prison authorities are going back to that. How do they feel about that? Is it working? You know, what, what's, what are the authorities saying? So you have to keep that controlling idea, all it mutates, it can mutate as you go out and, and shoot this thing. It, you know, you've got to have some kind of an idea before you go in and you have, a, you have to have a really solid idea because that controlling idea, everything you do in the film, it's got to be supported by these columns of information, visual information and written information, if in fact you're doing narration. If not, you have to have the prisoners and, and, and the wardens telling you, you know, uh, uh, giving you information that supports that controlling idea. Is this making sense for everybody? I'm, I know I'm going a little bit fast, but but we, you know our time is a little bit limited today. All right. Uh, so I do have a question for you, Bill. Uh, go ahead. What's happening 
when you have the idea, you have the core and the structure in your mind, you go on ground, you start collecting the material, whatever you see it is interesting. And what about in case that you find something that can twist your idea a little bit, something that you couldn't expect, but it is so intriguing. So you need to adjust immediately yeah. to yeah. what you are receiving at that moment. Can and you, you tell really, us a bit? You, that's a good question, Thanos. You really have to be open and, and you have to be mature enough, adult enough to say, okay, I made a mistake. It's not, you know, what I was expecting isn't happening. Something different is happening. And you just go with it, you know? You can't go with in, into these into these situations with a with narrow mind. Motion. Yeah, you can't. No, it's got to be. You know, you're there to listen. And I'll tell you, you know, uh, uh, you know, prisoners, poor peasants in Central America, Marines in Afghanistan. You know, they want to tell their stories. A lot of them want to tell, want them to tell their stories. And and you, and we have a tremendous responsibility. They trust us. They'll tell us their stories. They'll let us into their homes, sometimes even into their hearts. You know, and, and if we violate that trust, that's a terrible, that's a terrible thing to do. So we've got to stay open. And, and you know, people ask me, what, you know, what about these? You interview bad people sometimes, people who have committed crimes and so forth. You know, I'm not there to condemn people for what they have done or what they I think they have done or what they've been convicted of having done. That's not my job. My job is to tell their story and to get into their minds a little bit to find out why this has happened to them, why they're living in this situation, why their life has turned out the way it's turned out. You know, without condemning, without judging, this is the way, this is the way these people think. And they'll respect you for that. Okay. Okay. Uh, any other questions before we move on? Okay. So to, to understand th this, this, this uh, craft, to understand this language, we really kind of have to lift up the hood on a car, you know, and like look under it and figure out, oh, this carburetor, I know what that does. And oh, I think this is the alternator. I know, I understand what that does. These four things here or six things here, these spark plugs, I, I understand what they do now. So, you know, we're lifting up the hood to this, to this, to this methodology, if you will, which we call backpack journalism. And we're figuring out how these pieces work, okay? So what I wanna do now is I wanna talk about the ABCs of the visual storytelling language. It's the alphabet. And I'm gonna use, uh, a couple of years ago, I put together this thing. You can, and I'm, be, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not here to, to sell you anything. I'm really not, but uh, you know, uh, this is my manual, my essential manual, backpack journalism, backpack, uh, what is it? <laughs> The, the essential video journalism field manual. Okay, that's the official title of this thing. You can get it on Amazon. The, 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 the new ones that are, are 20 some bucks, I think. The, the, the used ones are like, I don't know, five or six bucks, something like that. Um, and it, it, it breaks all of this stuff down. I still use it in my classes. It's a couple of years. Um, 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 I, I have, I've done any, in, any revisions. Uh, let me see if I can find a way to Get out of here. Hold on. There we go. All right, I'm gonna go back to this screen. I'm gonna share the screen. I'm gonna go here, bingo. You should be seeing Michael and, and Robbie, right? Do you see them? You see my two characters? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Um, so, and, you know, here, and, and I just pulled, these are the screenshots that I took from the film, uh, obviously, and you can see, you know, uh, we do the, an informal here, informal interview here. We do a formal interview with the, with, with the superintendent of the place. You do, you know, this is, this is part of the controlling idea right here. These chains, we see these chains being pulled out of a box. We see the chains being dragged across the ground. We see the chains being attached to men's ankles. You know, this is part of our controlling idea, the chains. You know, so we have to have, we have, to have pictures. And, and I gotta tell you, nothing can take the place of, of close-ups in, in, in terms of bringing you know, uh, the information, bringing some intimacy to what you wanna show here. In close-ups, you know, particularly beginners, they'll go out and they'll shoot everything with wide angle because they're really impressed at how much stuff is in the picture. You know, they get everything, everything, everything is wide angle, wide angle, wide angle, and they come back and they, you see everything, but you, you don't really see anything on, a, on an intimate level. It's only until you get down on your knees and shoot, you know, close-ups like these where you see this guy's face, 
where you see this guy's got a really ruddy complexion, where you see the chains on this person's ankles, that, that's when people start, it starts to generate, it starts to resonate with them. I shot this with a long, you know, probably a 180 millimeter lens. This is a long shot. I have the camera actually down on the ground because I want, I want these folks in the background to be as close as I can to this guy in the foreground. Um, I call this a multiple layer of information. I'm always looking for multiple layers of information. I want to be shooting through this fence here, which is one frame of information. And again, this is the language that you'll, you'll find used in, in, in shops where you go. Sometimes it'll be different at, at, at CNN the, the, from, from, from Fox News or ABC from, from CBS. But this is the extra close up. This is the close up. And, you know, you can cut off the top of people's hair sometimes. I'm not um, seeing anything. No, we, we can't see that anything now. Oh yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. All right, I should be sorry. sharing. That screen's not working. Yeah, hold on a second. Share the screen. See it? Yeah. Got it now? Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you a little bit more sound here. You hear me better? Yeah. Okay, great. So this is a close-up. This is the, the extreme close-up here. You can see me making the circle around these glasses. This is a close-up. As I say, you can cut some of her hair off, but you want to leave space here. Why do we don't want to cut this woman's chin off? Why not? Why is that a no-no? Elena, what do you Wait. think? Go ahead. I don't know. It's because it's connected to the body? I don't know. Well, for the close up or for the extra close up? I think the answer is there because you might want to put name under the face. Yeah, I mean, you know, I do a lot of stuff overseas and sometimes people are talking a different language than English and you may want to put, you know, a, a, the translation right under here. You don't want to put it on top of her mouth. Okay, so you want to leave space here. We may just want to put her name here, you know, Sally Doe, whatever her name is. Um, a medium shot is typically, you know, from the top of the hair to around where the waistline should be. I always tell people, make sure that you get the belt in there, okay? And, and again, this is, these are the ABCs of the visual storytelling language. You know, you, you wanna know what these things are because if you don't, you know, uh, uh, you won't be able to, to converse with your, with your colleagues in the field. So, you know, here is the wide shot. It's got context around this person, but you know, just the definition that I use, it includes the, the hairline and it includes, it includes the feet, okay? That's, that's a, a, a wide shot. Here's an extra wide shot, all right? Um, you know, you got a lot of background here, you know, and, and you, you, you really give a sense of where this, where this woman is. This is a really, really, really useful uh, a shot, a point of view shot, because, you know, if, if you'll note in all of these pictures here, she's looking down, she's looking down. Oh, she's looking down at something she has in her hands. Oh, she's in a park. Oh, wow, this is, this is a city. It's not just in a country park. Now we finally find out what she's what she's reading, and if you really want to, you know, uh, uh, you know, change things up, um, you you've got you know her point of view, seeing what she's looking at as she looks over the top of of, of the uh, of this book here. We could have could have included part of her, you know, in the uh, in in the composition, like right here as well. It's it's um it's up to you if you want to do that. So that's that's the the. Um, the ABCs, what I call the ABCs of the, of the visual storytelling language. I want to go to this board now. Bill, can I ask a question quickly before you yes, go to the board? Yes, absolutely, please. Okay, because um, I do edit as well. Um, so sometimes, I remember when I, I used to be on the field, out in the field a lot, sometimes my camera guys and I would be discussing the, the, the planning the shots. And I often say, because I like to edit in the sense, in the sense that I like it, to be wide, I start from the wide and go into the close up for the um, the sound bite. So you go in, you zoom in. Exactly, zoom in. But then I think I remember someone saying it's best when you're shooting to start with the close up and go out. I was wondering if there's like any clear formula to that. Does it really matter how you start the shot or edit it? Whether you start from the close up or from the wide. That's a good question, but I think here's the answer. You do both. You know uh, uh, whether whether you, you know you, you decide you know what, what you really want there you you want pro i would probably start with a close-up um and then go out but what you really want to do to 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 help you as an editor or to make your editor happy you know if you start as a close-up then you go out like this don't forget to go back into the close-up okay and when you shoot these pieces it should be 
it should be 20 seconds here, at least, at least. If you open up, it should be 20 seconds here, and then you zoom back in, and it's 20 more seconds here. The same thing with the panning shot. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll show it with a camera. If you want to do a pan shot, you know, and you want to end up shooting this thing here in front of me, if you do like a boxer does, you know, put your feet, you can't see me, I know that. But if you put your feet like shoulder width apart and you point your toes toward your subject matter, this one here, your left, and then this one back here, you twist your knees a little bit, you bend your knees a little bit. So I want to make a picture of this person, but I want to show how, where, where that person is. I want to show context. So what you do is you start back here. You start to roll here, 20 seconds here, and then you just let your body relax. You let your muscles just go where they want to go, and it's going to take you back here. 20 seconds here, and then you push back, and you hold for 20 seconds here. You do it this way. You don't want to start like this, because if this is your target, your real target, you want to you don't want to push your way into what your real target is because you're straining and you're going to be less steady. Okay. You're going to be a lot less steady. So you start here and you just let your body relax. Just like that. These are fundamental things that you learn after years in the field. And, you know, if you listen to guys like me, I've been on the field forever. You know, you learn things that will take you a long time to learn. And, 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 and but if you listen to, to, to people who have a lot of experience, you won't have to reinvent the wheel because we've already done that, okay? You know, when you, when you make these pictures, I don't like to use tripods because it's just one more piece of equipment that I have to carry around. It's something new that I have to buy. Uh, you know, it's something that I have to be careful of if, if people are you know, around and they want to lift the thing, you know, and, and run with it. Um, so I, I try to get, up, get, get around without, I do, I do you know, uh, uh, interviews using the backs of the chairs as a, as a tripod, you know? So, so but generally to, to, to be able to make uh, and I think as part of my training as a still photographer, I can make pictures at a really, really sh low shutter speed um, 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 and not get camera shake because I, I've, I've done it as a still photographer. So when you, when you, you know, when you shoot video or even still shots, you know, the left hand has a real purpose here. It's to support the camera. And I do it not like this. I hold it like this so that I can, you know, control these dials without losing control of the camera itself, okay, while still holding it steady. This elbow goes into my hip here. All the stuff, I mean, especially if you're doing like you're shooting video or something that's long lasting, you know, I can shoot like this. I can, I can hold this like pretty steady for, you know, all day long because I'm really not holding anything. I'm not holding this up in the air like this. You know, after three minutes, my shoulders start to burn. After five minutes, they start to shake. But if I hold the camera like this properly, if I point my, my, my elbow into my hip and I hold the camera like this, I'm not lifting anything. You know, all the weight of this thing, and it's heavy, all the weight is going in here and it's going down to the floor. So you know, I, I can do this for, for a long, long time. Simple stuff like that that you learn that, you know, and it just takes time, okay? It just takes time of working in the field. All right, um, thank so, you. So uh, does that answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you. You're welcome. So I'm gonna use this board for a minute and you know, again, we're, we're opening up, we're lifting the hood of the car, we're looking under the hood and figuring out how the hell does all this stuff work, okay? And, and the more we do that, the more we break it down, the more we deconstruct this machine under here, the, the, the more efficient we'll be when we go out of the field and, 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 and we'll be able to shoot this stuff so that we come back after having broken down a scene or broken down a story, we can come back here in the, in the editing suite or in front of our computer and we can reconstruct we, what we, what we uh, uh, broke down out there. We'll re rebuild it here, you know, in the fashion that we want to, to, to build, rebuild it, okay? So that's what we're doing. We're like taking this machine apart and figure, figuring out how it works. So I'm gonna ask you, what does this, what is this? What is that? It's a rectangle. I'm sorry? A rectangle. It's a, it is a rectangle, but it's something else too. So I'm, this will make it, now you'll understand what it is. And it, you'll, you'll even more understand if I do this. What is this? The horizon? No, not, <laughs> this is, this is, this is audio one, this is audio two, this is video, okay? Timeline. This is a clip, okay. it's a clip, all right? 
And, and this, is, this is your basic fundamental. Think of, think of this, this house. This is a brick house that I live in. And, and the, 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 the basic building block of this house are bricks, OK? And you know, we put another brick here, but we're not building a house. We're, bu we're building a video story, OK? So we've got another one of these guys here. And we have audio one and audio two. This is the visuals. And we have, so if, if these are clips, when you go out and shoot these things, you want to make them be at least how long? At least how long do we want to shoot these things? 20 seconds. I'm sorry? 20 uh -huh. seconds. Third one time. shot. Yeah, one shot should be, one clip should be at least, at least 20 seconds long, OK? Because within, you know, if you're, if you're making a, a, a picture, like maybe a close up of somebody writing, OK? Just like I'm doing here. You're making a picture of, of me writing on something. And you want to, you want to, you know, make it at least twenty seconds long. You could shoot this thing for for a half a minute if you want to, until something happens, until I scratch my nose, okay, or 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 you know, check my watch, or do something like that. Because when I do that, when I pull this thing out of frame, what does that tell you? What does that tell you? Why do you want to shoot that? Why do you want to document that? When I pull my hand, or when I put my hand back in frame to write more. Why do I need that? It's a cutting point. It tells the audience, okay, you know, boom, go to another clip now. If I'm doing a story, or if you're doing, a, if you're shooting me, you know, writing on this board here, you know, when this happens, you can go to the next shot. Or when this happens, you can come in on this shot. Okay. So you want that movement. You want that in and out. So, but for our purposes right now, we're using this to demonstrate the building blocks of getting to this. This is, this is our objective, story. We start with these guys here. These are called clips, OK? What happens when we put a bunch of clips together? And I apologize. This is, I know I'm, I'm, I'm really bad at this, this part of it anyway. What happens when we put a bunch of these together? What do we, what do we end up with? And we're on our way to this here, to this thing here. We want to, we want to go from, from clips, right? Like the bricks on our house. We want, we have bricks first. We pile a bunch of bricks together to make this front wall. What do we have here though? What do we call this thing where we put a bunch of clips together? If we're doing, if we're writing a novel, if we're writing a book, okay? And we have, you know, the, the smallest unit of any book is called a- Chapter. No, not the smallest unit. Smallest unit. Word. Oh, the paragraphs. It's a word. It's a word. That's the smallest okay. unit, right? This, the comprehensible unit. So it's words. If we put words together in a string, we string it along, what do we have? Sentence. Sentence. We don't call them sentences here. We call them sequences here. Okay. Sequ so good. Okay. So we have a sequence. <laughs> All right. And if we put sequences together, what do we have? We're not at story yet. We're, we're at something else. What do we have? Segment. <laughs> we have a scene. So we go from clips to sequence to scene to story. We're, I'm standing in a scene right now. This is our scene. That place there. There's, there's a, a dining room over there. Everything that I can see here is part of the scene, okay? The stairs go, the stairs going to the second floor. Windows goes to the backyard. This is a scene. So when I wanna, if I wanna construct this scene, reconstruct, if I, if I wanna shoot, document this scene, I have to shoot, I have to make pictures of the visually defining characteristics of this scene, okay? And what are the visually defining characteristics of the scene? I just showed you some. What are they? What, what's the single most important visually defining characteristics of the scene? What is it? The clips. Yeah. Sorry? The clips. Well, you, yeah, you're going to start making clips of something. What's, what is, what is the, the most important thing? If, if someone told you, go into Bill Gentile's house while he's doing this documentary uh, presentation, to this Association of Foreign Correspondents and the shoot location. in his house. I'm sorry? 
the location of uh, wherever you're going to make the clips to make this to build the scene and all that. You can stand out in the street and make a picture of the house, of course. Yeah, but if you if you walk into the house, if you walk into this area, the single most important defining visually defining characteristic of what you're going to see when you walk through the front door is what. Like a landmark or establish, no. establish shot. You're going to see me. Hmm. You're going to see me. I'm the most, I mean, you're here because of me. All the other stuff here is peripheral. Of course, you know, uh, uh, the computer, which I have in my hand is important. So you want to make a picture of that. You want to make a picture of this board that I just wrote on. You want to make a picture probably of this television screen here. You know, I've got stuff on the mantle that's pretty interesting stuff from different countries. <laughs> Uh, maybe we'll go into the, you know, in that room over there. But, but, but what I'm, what I'm, what I'm trying to describe for you is, you know, if you're going to do a story about about me uh, uh, or or about this this workshop, you want to make pictures of of the reason why we're here. You know, me, the stuff that I'm using, the equipment, the cameras that I've showed you so far, the books, and so so on and so forth. Okay, so so that if you make pictures of this stuff, it it will allow you the time that you need to explain the story behind why I'm here. Um, let's do this. I want to show you something um, with the 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 uh, the field manual again. Let me find it, and and it'll explain a lot of what I'm talking about. So I'm going to go to page sixty-five. I learned a a system from a, a call, the guy that hired me to work at Video News International, actually. Um, um, and he called it something different. I call it the six shot system because I, I made it a little bit longer and more, um, I thought compelling. So, but I learned this thing basically from, from, uh, this, this is what I, we just went through clips. Are you seeing this? Me scrolling up and down, you know? No. no. Okay. Hold on. Um, I'm going to share this. Okay, this is what we just did. You know, we start with a bunch of clips. We have sequences here, you know, words, sentences, paragraphs or chapters here. And then that's where we, you know, you build on these. These are the little bricks. You know, this is the front wall. This is the, the, living, the living room where I'm standing. This is the whole story when we cover the whole house, me ro roaming around the house, okay? The six shot system is, is a device that will help you get the material you need in the field um, th that you can use to, to, to uh, 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 um, tell your story and, and that will give you the opportunity to uh, inject um, um, narration from, your, from yourself that you write or uh, information that you um, um, you gather from your from your 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 subjects, okay? It's the the, the the Bill Gentile six shot system. Keep in mind that any documentary, any video that you show, is going to be the best of them at least. Are not just you know films that you 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 gather information with and then you 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 pull up to somebody's front yard and, and you just like a big dump truck you dump it on their front yard. People don't you know. Uh, 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 consume um, or, or access information like that uh, very well. Um, they, the best films, the best documentaries, the best books for that matter, the best stories are told in a conversational way. You pose a question to your audience and then you answer that question, whether it's you know, with, with written with, with the words, whether it's with images, with, with narration, whatever. So it's, it's a conversation. Those are the best those are the best forms of, of, of transmitting information. So here I'm giving the audience, this is, this is the first shot of the six shot system. You don't have to shoot this stuff in order, but, but every time that I, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time. Every time that I go out and shoot, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm using this six shot system in my head. So the first shot here is, is what? This is, we call this a close up, correct? And it gives you information. What's the information that we, that we bring in from here? What, what do we see here? What's the information? Somebody's typing. Somebody's typing. Great. Um, we hope that this person is, is, is a man, correct? Yeah. We assume. We assume so. Um, what don't we know about this? We don't know who he is. 
right? Oh, what his character, talking. his role in the story. Right, we don't know any of that stuff. It's so it's, it poses more questions than it answers. We know that this is probably a man and he's writing something on, on what looks like a computer, you know, touchpad, okay? So what's the, what, you know, if you were to answer this question that we pose here, how would you visually answer this question? What would you do? Medium shot. I'm sorry? The person. Uh, do a medium shot of the person. A medium shot? Okay, we could do a medium shot of them. Um, um, a more intermediate shot would be, how about this? Close up as a face. We can't forget these close ups. These are vital. We have to have these close ups, okay? So one would assume that the, the, the hands that we saw in the first picture belong to this guy here, right? Yes. We're not going to show a picture of Lady Gaga here after we show the, the, the <laughs> person's hands writing on the, on the computer, probably, right? So, but to, just to confirm, you know, here's, a, oh, okay, here's the medium shot. Now we're certain that those hands belong to that face because we have some, we have some context here. We can see the person, his or her body. So that's, that's you know, the, the next shot in this six shot system. Oh, now we have a wide shot and we can see that this guy is in somebody's, you know, a living room. It happens to be mine because we have some context there. <laughs> you can see, you know, that, that the, the, the mantle right back there. All right, so now we're getting some real information. We, we still don't know a couple of things. We don't know who he is. We don't know who is writing, uh, you know. Uh, so what we do is, oh, there's the old arrow of the shoulder shot. This is really important, okay? Now, if we go to an extreme or an extra wide shot, we call it a master shot or an establishing shot. Why? Because it shows us, here's the computer, the guy's hands are behind there, here's, the here's, his, here's his face, here's the mantle. We know that this is somebody's living room. Now we see that he's being filmed by somebody. We don't know, uh, um, um, you know th that this is his daughter, which, which it is. Uh, we don't know what, what the purpose of, of the shooting is, but that's what narration is for, okay? So we know, we know what he's writing and we know that where he is, where, where he's doing all this stuff, okay? And you know, we, we can do this extra you know, uh, 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 over the shoulder shot. Um, I'm back there making pictures as well, okay? So if you go on, if you use this system, every time you go and shoot, it's almost a guarantee that you'll come back with the visual information that you need to tell your story and that will give you space enough to fit your story using narration if that's what you're gonna use. I'm gonna show you another piece now that I did. This is, I did this in Africa. Um, this was in 1996 or seven, and the piece is called "A Voice of the Voice of Hope," and it's about a radio station in the Central African nation. I'm going to stop uh, sharing for a bit. Um, I shot in the, in the Central African nation of of Burundi, okay, and I, I did this. Hold on. I did this. Um, in, in, in Burundi, uh, it was two years after the genocide in Rwanda, which is a neighbor, they share a border actually. And the, the, the uh, divisions or the racial breakdowns or the tribal uh, breakdowns of the two countries are, are, are the same. Uh, uh, in each country, Hutus are, are, are the majority, Tutsis are the mi minority. In 1994, of course, we had a horrible genocide in Rwanda when, uh, when 800,000 people were slaughtered in a hundred days uh, by the Hutus who were trying to obliterate the, uh, the Tutsi uh, 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 ethnic group. So uh, I was sent to, uh, co a colleague and I went to Burundi and did a piece on uh, a radio station called Studio Ijambo that was built to counter uh, the, the, the effect of, of the, the state-run radio that was used, for example, in Rwanda. In Rwanda during the genocide, the state-run radio, think of the, like the Voice of America or, 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 or um, um, you know, um, NPR, you know, you wake up in the morning and the guy on NPR says, go to, you know, Quesada Street or wherever, you know, 14th Street in Washington, D.C. There's a guy by the name of Bill Gentile there. He's, uh, he's married. He has a wife. Her name is so, such and such. Kill them. And the Hutus did because state radio told them to do so. Um, so, and, and so the authorities, it, 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 the, 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 uh, the program there, the studio was, was uh, uh, supported by an organization called Search for Common Ground. It's based here in Washington, D.C. And, and they spent a ton of money um, um, trying to, you know, hiring and using uh, both Tutsu, uh, Tutsis and Hutus in the same radio station to give people, a, you know, journalism that was actually factual and, and not, you know, filled with hate. So we did this piece for, for Ted Koppel, 
Nightline with Ted Koppel. And, and at that time, um, you know, Nightline with Ted Koppel was the one of the premier elite um, um, broadcast organizations in the United States of America. Let me find this thing for you. Here it is here. Okay, and I'm going to share a screen and we're gonna go here. Um, you should be seeing a big black screen. And this thing is like 14 minutes long. I might run a little bit over 1130. I'm, I'm sorry if, if I'm keeping you all, but I hope this is, is um, it, it's, it's uh, educational for you. You're gonna see here a lot of the stuff we've been talking about for the last hour and 20 minutes. It's gonna, it's gonna congeal, it's gonna crystallize and you'll see you, it'll, it'll all come into, into shape here. November 21st, 1996. Not so long ago, it was the worst kind of hate radio. What was broadcast contributed to violence, rape, and murder. Her father was killed, a victim of hatred. Her people were among the killers. But they are the best of friends. I know she can't hurt, hurt me or uh, anyone else. I trust her. They are inseparable. And now they're working, also on radio, to bring their people together. Except for people who are aiming for higher places or for power, we have nothing to gain from this war. And the man who helped it happen is an American. Tonight, the voice of hope. <laughs> This is ABC News Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. This is a program about the power of words. Words which have both the capacity to inflame, incite to violence, and words which can heal and restore peace. Where hatred and butchery have been the norm. This, as I suggested in the opening to the program, is a story about what happens when hate radio goes berserk and how the same medium can be used to restore peace. When we use the term hate radio in this country, we're actually exaggerating beyond all proportion, even where it exists in its vilest form. Radio in the United States has never succeeded in causing one group of Americans to take to the streets and start slaughtering tens of thousands of other Americans. That did happen, as we all remember, a couple of years ago in the Central African nation of Rwanda. It continues to happen in Rwanda's southern neighbor, Burundi, and the killing has spilled over into adjoining regions of Zaire, where hundreds of thousands of refugees from both countries have taken shelter. For the past several days, many of the refugees from Rwanda in particular have been returning home, and we'll have an update on that story at the end of this program. But what has been little reported is the influence that radio stations, which can be heard in all three countries, have had in provoking the violence. What has received even less attention are the courageous efforts led by an American civilian to stem the tide of hatred. The efforts of that man and some enormously brave Hutu and Tutsi men and women to offer some alternative programming carried on Burundi state radio are the focus of this report produced by Joanne Levine and correspondent Bill Gentile. This is the face of hatred gone mad. Here, Hutus massacred more than 400 Tutsis. At other times, it's been Tutsis killing Hutus. I apologize for not giving you a warning about that shot. Um, uh, just slipped my mind, but the rule in 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 um, in, in, in filmmaking, uh, at least for films like this, is you've got about 14, 15 seconds to engage an audience either intellectually or emotionally, and after that period, if you haven't engaged them, they're not going to stick around. They're going to go somewhere else. So I try to start the pieces that I do um, with uh, the best material that we have. I didn't shoot this. I shot the rest of the film. But this was this 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 material was was um, shot by someone else locally, I think. Um, um, yeah. So Joanne and I were were in uh, Burundi for two weeks when we shot this and put this thing together, and uh, we we spent two more weeks in, in in Rwanda doing a piece on the women who were raped during the 1994 genocide. 
There were dead bodies everywhere. Houses were burned and destroyed. But now it's been completely looted. All the roofs are taken off most of the houses. Meet 32-year-old New Yorker Brian Rich. He's devoted the last two years of his life trying to make sure this destruction never happens again. Brian came with an idea for reconciliation. I want to have to again. Convinced that radio could make a difference, Brian built Burundi's first independent radio service. As a songwriter, he understands the power of words, especially words broadcast over the airwaves. We're doing interviews with the people because basically this is the largest concentration of displaced people from Kamehameha. Studio Ijambo is one of the few places where Tutsis and Hutus work together willingly, covering a region haunted by the Rwandan genocide of 1994. Hutu militia massacred up to one million people, mainly Tutsis, and displaced another million. The reason that we even have a project is because of what took place in Rwanda and because of the role the media played in inciting people to commit violence. Voices over the airwaves launched Rwanda's genocide. The messages were very clear. They were not thinly veiled at all. It was basically, you know, go out and assassinate this people. It's your responsibility. Um, and openly calling for the extermination of Tutsis. We're trying to create a tradition of good information where there isn't one. Information can mean the difference between life and death. When you have a region that has been through as much instability as... Did you all see that? What, what, what did you just see? Over the shoulder. What else? In the living room, they were talking in the living room. Well, watch it again. One, we're trying to create a tradition of good information. Two, there isn't one. information can mean the difference Three, between life and death. Four, when you have a region that has been through as much instability. I shot this guy who turned out to be one of the stars of the, of, of the, of the film. You saw four, four clips of the six shot system. You don't have to include all of them in the film, but those four clips gave me time as an editor to put Brian Rich's, you know, information about the, the station underneath the pictures of, 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 of that reporter. So, you know, it, it's, it's vital that you're out there, you're making the pictures of, of not just the visually defining characteristics, but of the characters once you decide who they're going to be. And even people who aren't going to be characters, if they're of some, you know, of importance, you, you, you shoot them as well. It's a six shot system. Without that six shot system, I wouldn't have had the material to, to include the, uh, this, this uh, 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 narration by Brian. As you know, Rwanda, Burundi, Zaire, that radio is not just you know, listening to the news or choosing between 35 or 40 channels of information. You know, that is the lifeline to the outside world. That has the information about um, what's taking place. The information they get will determine if they cross the border. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this program this afternoon from Radio Burundi, the English service. Radio is everywhere. In one of the world's poorest regions, where only a fraction of the people can read and even fewer can afford a TV, radio is often the only source of information. Let me ask you a question. Um, what, what's the story about here? What's the controlling idea? Feeb? No. What's the controlling idea? Radio. Power of radio. The power of radio? Okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Let me ask you this. Is, is the story about Brian Rich at Studio Ijumbo, or is it about Studio Ijumbo with Brian Rich? And the two are very, very different stories. Yeah, the two are different, yes. What, it's about what, what, the studio I'm who sorry? has Rich. It's about the studio who has Rich in it. It's about, okay, so you're saying that this, the story is about Studio Ijumbo with Brian Rich, correct? Yes. Yes, you're exactly right. That's exactly what it's about, okay? Now we have the controlling idea, and, and here's the, this, this and, and forgive me again, okay? Uh, because I'm bad at this component of the, of, the, uh, of the whole affair here. And I'm going to let you guess what this is, okay? This is, here's the dead giveaway right here. 
That's the getaway, giveaway rather. And here, what is that? Anybody? Car, a truck. <laughs> it's a truck, it's a pickup truck, come on. So, Yay. and we're gonna give it a name here. We're gonna call this pickup truck BR. Oh, Brian Rich. Brian is a vehicle that we're gonna use. We're gonna put a bunch of stuff in here. Look at this stuff here. What is that? As a story. That's information. And, and Brian is gonna take us up this dramatic arc. Remember this dramatic arc. Here's, here's the controlling idea here, which is this thing here, Studio A Jumbo with Brian Rich. That's this, that's where we put the, the controlling idea. Brian is, we're gonna fill him up with information about Studio A Jumbo. He's gonna bring us up this, 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 you know, the big hill here. This is all information. If we have the opportunity, we'll put some of this in it. What is that? What does that look like for you? That's yes, tension. Yes, in Studio A Jumbo. That's tension. And Brian's gonna help get us here. And this is what, what do we call this? The climax. The climax. Okay, now th this is the main dramatic arc. And, and the key to, to this story is that there are a number of sub dramatic arcs here. And you'll see in all of them, coincidentally or not coincidentally, not coincidentally, they have, you know, they're wrapped around um, character. Character is king. Don't forget, character is king. Let's watch a little bit more of this. We have the military come in. We've had victims of human rights abuses in the studio. We've had ministers. We've had parliamentarians. We've had foreigners, UN, students, black market money changers. I mean, this studio has really kind of experienced just about every aspect of the conflict here from every angle. But what truly set Studio E Jumbo apart is its staff of 17 people. Brian set the tone from the beginning. He hired people from both sides who believed they could work side by side toward a common goal. The journalists, when they, when they come into the studio, they're journalists and they leave their ethnicity at the door. Um, I don't want them to leave their identity at the door, but I don't want them to bring any form of bias or partiality into the studio. Joni Ruth Mikishumana, a Hutu, and Jocelyn Sambura, a Tutsi, live by that tenet. They've been part of each other's lives for six years, despite their starkly different pasts. Joni Ruth's father was killed by Tutsis when she was two. Jocelyn grew up in California, the daughter of a Tutsi diplomat. There has been uh, a gap that's been created between the Burundians. And what we're doing is trying to bring them back together. Because after all these years of war, it's like um, people have been poisoned and told that they just can't live together or that, the, that they can't trust each other. I couldn't see this crisis or uh, the fact of not being from the same ethnic group coming to, to break our friendship. No. <laughs> Behind every screen where you watch a, a film, a documentary, uh, you know, whatever, there is, there is some kind of architecture that somebody puts together. Some, sometimes it looks like this, sometimes it doesn't, but someone has to figure out where they're gonna introduce people, how this thing is gonna change, where the climax is gonna be, what the controlling idea is, um, and, and the same thing that happened to this piece that, that Joanne Levine and I put together. What just happened to this drawing? What just happened to this, this architectural drawing in terms of what you saw on the screen? Something major happened. What? Um, there were uh, tensions uh, in the beginning, but then with the climax, there, there's like the peak of the story. Um, there's, it's sort of like there was bad news and in the end, it's good. Okay, somebody else, give me, some, give, me, give, me some, give me something else that just happened. Something just happened to this structure. The teller of the story is someone else though. Ah, okay, then we, so we introduced someone else. Who are those someone else? The two ladies. Two women. 
Ah, now we're getting somewhere. So we'll call this one two girls. Okay, or two ladies, whatever. Okay, and we're gonna, you know, we already filled up this thing half with information about, you know, one, one's, one's father was killed by the other tribe and, and, and one was raised in California. So, you know, we've got this information and they're gonna help us also to get there. Okay, so this is a, this is a dramatic arc within a dramatic arc. And we've got other ones who are gonna come up here. And I have to ask an important question. We're halfway, almost exactly halfway into this piece. Um, I can, I'm happy to continue. And this is, I think is a Thanos uh, uh, a decision or and a collective decision with the rest of you folks here. I'm happy to continue this piece with you and finish the presentation. We can stop now or, and, I, and I can take questions, whatever you wanna do. I can stay on. You can stay on? Yeah. Okay, Phoebe's gonna stay with us. That's how you pronounce your name, Phoebe. Phoebe. <laughs> okay, Phoebe's gonna stay. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna stay. Mm -hmm. Okay, someone else is gonna stay. Frank, you're gonna stay. All right. Then I can stay, but I'm ho I'm hoping there will also be time for questions. Okay. Yeah. We should, we, I think we have about seven minutes of this to go, and then I'll, I'll take questions. I'm here as long as you want me to be here. Okay. Right. All right. Here we go. Okay. So you know, keep your eyes out for another for another uh, 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 dramatic arc. Studio E Jumbo produces more than news. It records music and creates programming to bridge the ethnic gap. Jolie Ruth and Jocelyn translate a soap opera written by one of the region's famous writers. It's about how friendship between two families, one Hutu, the other Tutsi, gets tested after one of the men is killed during an ethnic clash. A storyline not unlike their own. How can a small group of devoted journalists bridge the gap between the warring factions? Here's part two of The Voice of Hope. Studio E Jumbo is funded by Search for Common Ground, a Washington, D.C. based nonprofit that tries to resolve conflict through the media. Hello? Bonjour, c'est Brian. Brian fights to translate this idea into action in a region where airwaves mean power and the power elite guard the airwaves. It's been an uphill battle from the start. When I arrived, people basically laughed in my face. He's built the studio on the fundamentals of good journalism. Fairness is everything. 31-year-old Alexei Sindouhije is the studio's star and one of its founding reporters. Like everyone else in the studio, his life has been touched by violence. Alexei is a Tutsi who covered the genocide against Tutsis in Rwanda. He's had to go into exile for months at a time because of death threats by the military. If everyone refused to take risks, what would happen in this country? If everyone stopped doing their own work, if all the NGOs decided not to give food to those people because they're taking risks, what would happen? For Alexei, the story is often personal. You know, she's old. She was a, a good friend of my mother. This refugee camp, the Johnson Center, is run by two American missionaries. It sprung up on the Johnson's property and has become a haven for more than 7,000 Hutus fleeing the Civil War. 300 people yes, left this morning because they saw militaries. This is the latest casualty, a six-year-old girl who was shot. I think that if a Burundian finds himself in front of a white person, I think that for white people, we're all blacks. We're not Hutus or Tutsis. They're stereotypes that were given, but there are practically no differences. The staff of Studio E Jumbo operates in a country under siege. An international embargo has crippled a nation already handicapped by civil war. Fuel is scarce. Residents must walk to work and the market. Most people now spend their nights in darkness. We're providing information that nobody else would dare provide at this point. The studio has developed a faithful audience. We've had situations where people have come on bicycle from the interior with notes from someone with the statistics of a massacre. 
you know, very precise, you know, 200 people buried here, killed this way at this time. For Studio e Jumbo reporters like Alexei, there is no real security. Last year, soldiers raided Alexei's home, roughed up his infant daughter, and promised to kill him if his negative reporting persisted. To do his job, Alexei must constantly step into the fray. He's one of the most courageous journalists I've ever seen working anywhere. I mean, he will risk his life perhaps too easily to uncover or cover on events in very dangerous circumstances. He's probably saved at least my life once. Alexei's picked up a rumor of fighting in the countryside and calls his military sources. Hello? Hello, bonjour, mon colonel. It's a constant strain, professional and personal. Alexei's own brother, an army captain, criticizes his reports, saying they endanger his fellow soldiers. But Alexei is unwavering in his mission to seek out the truth. He heads out the next day to check on the reported fighting. Where is the hospital? The destination, a village supposedly 90 minutes from the capital in Burundi's tropical highlands. Along for the ride is Chris Tomlinson, an Associated Press reporter. Our driver's name is Moses. Like this? Outside the city, flak jackets are standard gear. Okay. And so is beer. Even in war zones, shipments never stop. We race with time, calculating how long it will take to get to the village, do the reporting, and return to Bujumbura before dark. If we continue, we're going to be in Gero. Right. So at the next road, we want to go left. So, okay. We, we turn uh, left. Delays and more delays. Even Alexei is getting nervous. So which way is Marisa? This way. Mm. Finally, we arrive at the village. Alexei runs into his brother, the captain. Okay. He sends us to a local official. The battle that Alexei came to report on turns out to have been a brief firefight. Just another chapter in the story of Burundi's slow motion suicide. Nine person killed. No, no, he said seven were killed. Seven killed. By the time we leave, it's later than we planned. I don't know how long it takes to get from Burundi to Kaganga. If we drive back the long way, we risk a nighttime arrival. We take the quicker, more dangerous highway. This is where I came up on a uh, truck two minutes after an ambush with a dead body in it. Our driver Moses does not flinch. It's okay now? No. Continue. We've got about another 20 kilometers. <laughs> Soldiers moved in to retake the highway, where we later learned two women were killed in an ambush. <laughs> Moses has delivered us from the wilderness. Because we was we, we was with a, a former marine. <laughs> I was a soldier, not a marine. There's a difference. <laughs> All this adversity has fostered an increasing closeness among the staff. The studio remains an escape from the brutal ethnic divisions. Outside of work, Jocelyn and Jolie Ruth must fight for their friendship. You have to be quite strong and you have to explain like listen she's my friend she's one she's my best friend okay we've been together for how many years and you're not coming to tell me how she is i know her better than you i got the same problems with the friends some members of my family and he said no you you don't know justin hasn't uh hasn't pushed my my, my family away she wasn't there <laughs> she isn't responsible for what happened to my family or uh, the, the crisis which is uh, going, going on here. People here, they want people to take sides or think the way they think. Like, we can be friends and not have, and not have the same opinion on a lot of things. And I'll, re I'll respect her opinion as she will respect mine. And as she says, I know she couldn't do anything to harm me. And that's important too. People have to learn that when... You really believe in friendship. You know that um, 
You can't hurt each other. It's a Saturday afternoon, and the staff of Studio E Jumbo has come together to dance, to laugh, and to try and forget. What we want is to work, play, and live our lives without being afraid of getting killed or without being suspicious, suspicious of each other. And except for people who are aiming for higher places or for power, we have nothing to gain from this war. The regional conflict deepens, but Brian's time is up. He is transferred to a post in Europe. He spends his final days ensuring the studio will continue without him. It's not easy with, you know, vehicles, generators, gas, faxes, telephones, long distance phone bills. It takes organization to make it work. And the united resolve of the 17 Hutus and Tutsis who make up Studio Ijambo. I'm not uptight about what's going to happen to the studio. I'm uptight that maybe my not being here will make them more vulnerable to pressure by the military, by um, different political factors. The overriding anxiety is that someone's going to get killed that works on this project. And they're probably going to get killed working in the field, gathering information. And that I'm going to feel responsible in some way because I helped them believe that that was okay. Brian plans to return to the region periodically to oversee the project. He's confident his time was well spent. His legacy will stand. Brian began the studio and he brought a lot to it. And we thank him for that. But um, I think the reason why he's so proud of the studio is that he knows that the studio will continue with or without him. The machine is on. I mean, I think it's not going to stop. Correspondent Bill Gentile and producer Joanne Levine on assignment for Nightline. Okay, I'm going to uh, stop sharing here. Um, and before I take a question, um, I'll just point out that uh, there were a couple of other dramatic arcs within the broad dramatic arc, and they're all, they're all done now. You know, Brian, he's taken off, he's going to, to, to uh, another post. Uh, the two young women are still friends, their, their friendship survived. Um, Alexis is okay, he's, you know, he, he uh, uh, got back from that mission uh, into the mountains and he's still reporting. And that journey, whenever you see that there's a journey in, in, in what you're covering, all journeys by definition have a beginning, a middle, an end. What you've got to be, you have to, you have to be concerned about is you've got to shoot every component of this because if we would have gotten into more trouble than we did, a couple of guys took a couple of shots at us. Um, I had to have the beginning shot, you know, the beginning part when we, we first got in the Jeep and we were looking at the map and we got lost, we couldn't find the place. I had the, I had that, the middle uh, part when we, we, we talked to some officials where we, where we landed. And, and, and if I hadn't shot either one of those, the beginning of the middle, the end shot, I have no way of, of explaining it. I have no context. I can't use it. It's useless. Okay. So you got to, you got to, you, you have to, you know, when I, when I said earlier that you have to be vigilant, you have to be asking yourself all the time, what's the story now? What's the story now? What's the story now? Okay, a journey is coming up. Shoot the beginning, shoot the middle, shoot the end. Because if you don't shoot the beginning and the middle, the end does you no good. It could be the good, most extraordinary firefight that you ever saw, and it's no good. Uh, I'm here for your questions. Yes, uh, Bill, I have a question. So I produce stories uh, for my audience in Indonesia uh, for television. So even though we produce it here in the US, but we have to follow uh, Indonesian regulation. So, and, and one of the regulations is that we are not allowed to show dead bodies or even cigarettes on, like people smoking cigarettes. And I see that on your uh, video. So I'm just curious about what's the regulation here in the US uh, present day. I don't think we have any reg regulations like that. And, and th this piece, you have to remember, Nightline was a piece that came on television like 1130 at night. Um, so, you know, in theory, the kids were already in bed um, and adults were watching the program. And, and the, the, the program was tailored for the intended audience are, uh, were, were policymakers, um, people who are, you know, journalists, uh, people with uh, university degrees. It wasn't for, you know, it wasn't easy watching. And it, some, some of it was, was very complex. Ted Koppel, it, it, uh, I think he's more, more retired than not these days, 
but he's just an extraordinary guy. I mean, he, he, I think he read the script for our piece, didn't even see the piece until, you know, uh, before he, he, he delivered that, uh, that, that opening, uh, the opening remarks. He just had an extraordinary capacity to absorb tons of information, um, um, you know, uh, and, and present it in a way that was compelling and that was accessible for, for, for the audience. Um, so it was a different kind of a program, um, um, you know, than you see most of the time today. And, and um, I think you still see dead bodies occasionally on, on American television. So we don't have the same restrictions, I guess. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to ask you uh, about the tools you presently use for yeah. vid video and sound acquisition. Uh, what you prefer, what you like using in the field, uh, and what gives you the best uh, mobility uh, when you're running and gutting and, co and covering stuff. You know, I wanted, we ran out of time, but I wanted to talk with you about sound because sound is really, th I really appreciate this question, Frank. Uh, uh, sound is the heartbeat of what we do. You know, the, the engine inside these pieces are the, are the visuals. I mean, you know, you can, you can turn off the sound and in the best of cases, best documentaries, you can figure out, you know, basically what's, what's happening. But the sound, you know, people will even forgive if, if, if a shot is, you know, composed badly or if it's a little bit out of focus or whatever, but they won't excuse bad, bad, bad sound. They, they won't. Exactly. So, so, you know, I did a piece and I went to, to the Amazon, the Ecuadorian Amazon like a couple of years ago, and did a piece. Uh, it's on. You, you, you can find it on, on Univision. It's called um, 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 "When the Forest Weeps," and it's about the incursion of miners and and, and loggers in, in the in the Amazon who are you know bringing so-called modernity to the to the, the indigenous people there, who are fighting against it. And you know, I had to rig up. You know, I went during the rainy season, and and. Um, um, you know, I knew that we were going to be going up and down rivers on these like dugout boats. Sometimes they flip over, and I didn't want to have a six thousand dollar you know uh, camera owned by American University. I have the luxury of using their their stuff, but if I if I wreck it, then I have to pay for it. So I took this. This was it. I took this, and you know, for sound, for sound, I rigged up. This is you know this this is actually a, a ruler here uh, that I uh, uh, bent and 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 drilled and and you know adapted so that I could put. Um, you know, this thing, the, uh, the, the camera, it's an iPhone six. So I could put this thing in this holder and I put Velcro, um, on places like here that I could put, you know, that I could, I could mount the receiver. I got a couple of adapters and, you know, I can put this thing in here. And I can, I can, you know, run around and shoot this, is, you know, you can buy a hundred different kinds of this stuff now, but they didn't, they didn't exist when I first put this thing together, which is why I had to build it myself. So I always have two channels of sound. I always have two channels of sound. You know, if, if this is the receiver and this is the, the, uh, the transmitter. Um, and even if I don't have this on one of my subjects, I will put this on myself because, you know, God forbid something happens with, with the other channel of sound, you know, I've got this thing um, in my shirt pocket. If I, if I could open my shirt pocket, there you go. I put it here and I'll just put it on here and I'll have a second channel of sound, okay? When I'm not using this, um, I'll, use, I'll use this little thing. I mean, it's not a miracle worker, but it works. I'll use this guy um, as, and I can you, you, you either you know use it with this handle or not uh, or just just on, on the phone by itself. Um, but I'll have you know this this increases the reach of the sound a little bit, and it's actually you know it, it works. It's fine. Who you know? makes that? What is it? Who makes that thing? Yeah. What what product is that? It's called Amp Ridge. A M P R I D G E. Amp Ridge. Can you see that? Yeah. Amp Ridge. And it's I'm, plugged into, does the iPhone 6 have some extra jack or something that is no longer in the iPhones for a sound or something like that? Well, this one has, uh, I, I don't know what the new one is. This one's old. Yeah, this it's like iPhone it's 6. that they've stopped putting that jack in, in the iPhones or something and that that's, everybody gets, is all exercised about it. It's like the last model where you could monitor sound or something with headphones or something. Yeah, no, that's too bad. 
but I mean, this worked wonderfully. And, and to answer your, to further your question, Frank, you know, um, I and, and I'm sorry that I don't have any in, in any of this footage to show you right now, and we don't have time to do it. But um, uh, in 2017, I took a, a graduate student from American University, you know, a little older than a typical graduate student, wildly talented guy. And we went to Mexico and shot, in 10 days, we shot a documentary called Freelancers with Bill Gentile. You can, get, you can watch it for five bucks on iTunes. You can see it on Amazon. It's called Freelancers with Bill Gentile. It's being distributed um, by Journeyman TV. Um, the National Geographic is, is distributing the, uh, the, the, the documentary. Um, all over uh, across Latin America and the Caribbean. It's being uh, also broadcast in um, the Arab speaking MENA countries, Middle East and North African countries. Um, and we did a documentary in 10 days and he did it with you know this just little Sony uh, uh, mirrorless camera, a fairly recent model, 2017. And I did a couple of you know a couple of shots with this thing and you can't tell the difference. I mean, you know, it just worked, you know? So, um, so that's 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 what we use in terms of gear. Uh, it, it gear it, it is 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 important, but just as important as the gear itself is knowing what the gear can and can't do. You know, I know what this thing can do. I know what its weak spots are. I know what its strong spot, spots are. I can put this thing in my backpack. I can put it in a, in a, in a sandwich bag, and you know they can flip over the the the, the, uh, the boat if they want to in a river. But I'm I'm still going to have a camera when I come up out of the water. I can't say the same thing for a six thousand dollar camera that I get, you know, at American University. So it, it, it it's it's bad, and, and you can't use a zoom on this camera. It's not very good, um, um, and it, you know you have to make make adjustments. Phoebe, you had a question. What editing program do you use, like on the on the road to? Uh, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with these things like LumaVision and stuff. Somebody else cut something for me recently where they were able able to do things with still shots with where there was movement and things that made those stills. When you had to put in a still as a Band-Aid, you probably know what I'm talking about. Because yeah. something screwed up and you want to distract people from like someone who sounded like they were reading or whatever. And they, he was able to do cool things. And I'm like, what's something that's like not Final Cut that you think is a good editing program for this stuff where it just you can do some pretty complex, cool stuff with it? But yeah, it's I'm not sorry, I can't like the question very well because what, what, you know I, I was going to answer. We use Final Cut Pro, and you can oh. do that with Final Cut Pro. Yeah, yeah, he uses it, but it caught, I guess it's like a constant licensing fee you have to pay, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't. Well, you have to pay for Final Cut Pro, yeah. Um, so that's what you use. That's what we use for the for the for the for the film for the documentary of the, the freelancers documentary. And what Matt did, he shot with, with uh, I guess it was 4K. Um, you know, which is really super high res resolution of, of, of one of these Sony uh, mirrorless cameras. And he punched in a lot, you know, it, it's, it's really a, a really beautiful editing tool that, 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 that people use who can who shoot with a, a 4K. You know, you could shoot a wide shot like this. And, and, and if you want to cover up someone's coughing or making a mistake or whatever, you, can, you punch in, you know what I mean? And, and you have, you, you, it's, it's a close up, you know, um, and, and you, you don't lose any, any, any definition, any quality of all. I mean, you're saying Final Cut enables you to kind of actually go in on something without you having actually physically done that in the field. Yeah, yeah, you don't, you don't zoom. You're saying that's a great effect on that thing to cover up crap, and uh, you, but you're not sure if other programs have it. It's one of those things where I've been trying to avoid buying it, but someone did such a superior, great job on this thing where I, I didn't have time to do it, that I'm just yeah. like in love with being able to recreate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you working on? <laughs> you know, man, I, I'm working on actually learning how to do this stuff. I had to tape something for a friend, a spot to try to get him a, a position somewhere like in, and it was a competitive situation, like hundreds of people. And I, I scripted this thing and I gave it over to a friend who did it quite, and he won this. On wow, wow, on wow. This thing. And I'm just, I'm just not a, an adept enough editor. Like I'm just learning how to do this. Yeah. And then scrutinizing that thing. And then I got this guy to, I was applying for something. Imagine Entertainment has a, a program, you know, to learn how to do TV pilots and stuff like that. And I gave up and I got this guy to cut something for me, a 30 second thing, but it's just, it's a superior cutting job. I need to learn how to do it because I don't want to have to pay for it every time. I'll tell you what, uh, 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 my the, the guy that I'm talking about, uh, Matt Chipolone, is is he's just he's just getting back today. I, last yesterday, he just got back yesterday, I think, from from Afghanistan, 
And uh, if you drop me a line, I'll, I'll, I'll make it. I'll make a uh, an intro, an, an okay. online intro between you and, and and Matt. And he can. I mean, the guy is like he's really, really, really tech savvy. You mean he knows about all different kind, all this stuff? I think so. Yeah, he's way beyond where I am. He's way beyond where I am technically. Way beyond. Way so beyond. it's like I have now all the equipment, but I just need to now know how to how to actually create it with a, the editing program. Like I'm yeah. just not too clumsy with it. I, I don't know how to work it. Maybe he can- Yeah, I think that Sorry. Uh, while I've started learning how to edit video segments, the, the software that I found the most easy to learn is the Adobe Premiere RAS, which uh, that you can cut oh. easily. It's not the extremely high tech software, but- what Adobe, Ad, Ad, Adobe, Adobe Premiere Rush. Rush? Rush. Rush. Are you like, are you oh, are you sorry? <laughs> yeah, sorry. Are you yeah. are you S H? So you're saying that's good. I felt like I maybe used that quickly. I have an illicit kind of version of that to be honest with you. And yeah, I mean it's easy. Like, I mean I didn't know how to use it and I learned it immediately in one week. Like I was trying to use iFilm as the, and it's just like, I just can't, I, it just, I don't think it can do what I need. And, and then LumaVue's vision is just too difficult right now for me. And I'm just struggling, but that's good. Thanks for telling me about that. Cause I might try my hand in that one. Great. <laughs> uh, anybody else? I see there's one raised hand here. Whose hand is that? That's okay. Uh, any, any other questions? Yeah, well, I, I... It's more of a concern that I have because um, I was freelancing, especially during the last elections for a station that I used to work for in the Congo, but because I'm here, I was freelancing for them during the election. And one thing they always want for every story they, the commissioner reported to do is to do a piece to camera. And I'm shooting alone and I had um, a Canon EOS camera that doesn't have the uh, the what you call it, the flap with the, the extra screen. screen yes yeah. so then my challenge was how do I do a piece to camera if I can't see myself in what I'm I can't even frame myself properly but thankfully yeah. on that day on the election day I went out with a friend so we were able to do it and because I still haven't found a solution to that I'm not pitching to them as much as I want to because they want a piece to camera for every story you do and I don't know how I'm gonna go around it. I have a, a Google a Pixel phone that takes really great videos, but I'm also worried about the fact that there might be differences in the yeah. picture quality at the end of the day, because one is Canon, one is um, Google. Get a tripod, get, get a tripod and, and, and you know, when you're out shooting, you know, grab somebody on the street and say, do me a favor, stand here. You know, and and like either you know go like this, like your your approximate height, and then you go around the camera, see if it's see if see if it's it's, it's framed properly. You know, you just have to be creative about it. That's all. You can still use that that camera. I mean, it's a pain in the butt, you know, and, and shoot wide so they they can crop down if they want to. Okay. You know. Yeah. All right. I do have a tripod though. Yes. Yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah. Take it. Have to take it. That. You shoot shoot wide so they can. You're shooting. What is it? Is it a, a high high resolution? For um with a Canon. Yeah, it's 4K? Yeah, um, no, I don't think so. I'll have to check, but I don't think it's 4K. Check yet. it out. If it's 4K, yeah. you don't have a problem. They can, they can take, they can, you know, they can take this and cut it down to this and you won't, you won't notice the difference. Okay. Any other questions? Is that you, Faith? Yeah, no, I was, I'm, I'm like, I, I just- Phoebe, I'm, I'm sorry. Distracted. <laughs> uh, I'm just thinking. Um, uh, uh, sorry. That's all right. That, all right. You know, we'll it's all the technical stuff. It's that I wish there were someone giving us out. I just, it's just like all the, and I guess it's, you'll never have this because everyone has varying equipment. Yeah. It's just yeah. how to, it's about the technical, you know. Yeah. Putting that, putting it all together. But well, this was helpful with the how to string a story together, the stuff to bear in mind in terms of just, you know, I watch these things mindlessly. Mm. Like I'm a, a dummy about it. Who, and it just sort of like it helps having it pointed out with a big arrow that there's actually a whole thing going on. And it's like a haiku in terms of structure. Yeah. You know, and that 
uh, that there's actually an art to doing it. Yeah, it, it, I, I think this whole idea of taking things apart and figuring out, you know, like this part goes here, this part goes there, deconstructing the, the pieces really, yeah. really is useful. I do, I agree. Um, again, I'm not trying to sell you guys anything, but you know, if, if you if you you know uh, take a look at the, um, I mean, it's a really small investment. You can get one, you know, for a few bucks. Take a look at that that, that essential field manual I have out on Amazon. Is that book? so? While we were on, I actually bought that book. <laughs> You'll be happy oh, to hear. Not. You have one satisfied customer already. Did you get the second edition. Well, it's the, the thing is, it's the the one that I found that was. I got a first. Is there so much difference between the first and the second? That's the question. No, no, no. no it's some difference, mild difference. Okay, because I found a first that was that was cheap and then I was going to try that and then upgrade to the second one. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Any other questions? Bill, you mentioned you um, you teach at American University. Is yeah. that at the uh, MA in digital storytelling? Yeah, they, they, they've got a they've got a, a you know a really dynamic uh, uh, master's program. Uh, uh, at, at, at the university, um, we're, I think we're one of the top 20 in the country now. Okay, I just applied to that program. Oh, wow, wow, <laughs> fantastic, that's great. Hope to see you sometime soon. Thank you. So you're gonna have a, you have a contact from Matt Sipalone that somehow. Yeah, um, uh, it, 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 drop me a line, billgentile at billgentile.com. This goes for all of you if you have questions. If I can be of uh, some assistance, it's, it's it, uh, Bill Gentile, B-I-L-L-G-E-N-T-I-L-E, -L -L -E, Gentile, which is an Italian name, um, and uh, at BillGentile.com, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to respond to your, to your questions, OK?